Okay, good evening and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we're looking at verse 171, which reads as follows Eta pasati mang lokang, chitang rajaratupamang, yatam bala visidanti, nati sango vijanatang. Which means, come look at this world decked out just like a king's chariot wherein the fools fall or get caught up in nati sangu vijanatang but the wise there is no connection for the wise one of these famous verses in the Buddhist world. So the story, not much of a story, it's in fact a repeat. Um, and you wonder about these repeats, what are they, why it is that two people have the same story, and it's acknowledged that they have the same story. Not sure why how that works, um, but the story is um, the same as Santati. Santati was a minister of the king, and Abhaya Kumara is uh, actually a prince, the son of the king. But he pleased the king, and the king gave him great reward. And part of the reward was a dancing girl. So I don't know how old Abhaya. Um, but Prince Ambaya was was at the time, but it may have been his first experience. Maybe he was a teenager or something, and he was. I assume he's a little older than that, but it, maybe he was young, and he fell in love with this uh, dancing girl, this woman who had woman who had been hired to dance for him, and uh, she. If it's the same in the, in the story of Santati, Santati, and I guess in the story of Ambaya as well, she she didn't take good care of herself. She, there was a sort of a strict regimen for dancing women. They had to starve themselves. I think is the uh, yes. They had she she fasted for seven days to have a graceful body. It sounds a bit extreme, but. There you have it. People do extreme things and are forced into extreme situations. And so, so she died. And same thing as with Santati. And he grieved over the. Maybe it was a common thing. Maybe because it was so common for them to starve themselves that it was also a common thing for them to drop dead. Makes you wonder why how the system continued when all these dancing women kept dying. But there you have it. Um, and Abhaya immediately thought, he was grieved at the loss of this woman. And he immediately thought of the Buddha. He was the son of Bimbisara. Bimbisara was a great patron of, of Buddhism, a great supporter of the Buddha, one of the First, uh, famous lay disciples, you know, famous in in that in that time. He was um, a, a great patron, and sort of the first major support of of Buddhism in a, in a worldly sense, in terms of providing a monastery. Uh, he, he was the one who donated the bamboo grove, and so immediately Abhaya thought of the Buddha. And this is a common thing as well. When when the going gets tough, it's common for ordinary people, ordinary in the in a neutral sense, people who had no special thoughts about religion or religious practice or meditation. It's it's a common thing for them to suddenly become you might say exceptional. 
because uh, they do think about things that people normally don't think about. Someone who has suffered a great disturbance in their life is more likely to, well, obviously more likely to consider a, a larger picture or, or consider a more uh, a more nuanced or profound answer to life. Right? If if the going is if it's going well, if everything is going well, it, we're less likely to, or we're more likely to uh, be content with a simple explanation or simple answers, a simple philosophy. One of the simplest is try your best to always get what you want. And of course, in cases like this, it, it becomes clear that that's not only not possible, but highly problematic. It's a cause of great stress and suffering. Uh, and so when you lose something that something that you hold dear, especially when that something is actually a someone, which makes it so much more um, stressful, more upsetting, yeah, to put it lightly. Uh, when, when this happens, it's, it's a real cause for reflection and Questioning, questioning your 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 outlook, realizing that it's not it's not really going to work. This is a bad choice of philosophy, and so you ask questions, and so it's the sort of thing that obviously it happens, and it's a major cause for people to uh, look towards religion, or more appropriately, meditation and. and mental development, realizing that their minds are ill-equipped to deal with suffering. And so Abhaya thought, now's a good time to go see the Buddha. And the Buddha said to him, yes, it's true, this is a great loss for a human being to lose another human being who they held dear. But the truth is, this has been happening since time immemorial. Every, every lifetime we cry over loss. How many tears we shed. If you, if you, if you uh, think in terms of the, or within the framework of Buddhist cosmology or, or theory, with the idea that we're reborn through infinity, yeah, no discernible beginning or end, then the number of tears that we've shed is greater than all the water in all the oceans. Imagine that. Think of how many tears you've shed in this life so far. How many tears have I shed so far? I wonder how much that would be. Would it fill a cup? Let's see. One cup of tears. How many? How much sadness is, does it take for one cup of tears? Probably more than that, even in my short life. Probably more than a cup. But let's say one cup. I don't know. We'll just guess. The average person cries one cup. Does that seem like too, like not enough? Two cups? Ten cups? How many cups of tears do you cry in a lifetime? It's a very good question, I think. We don't think of it. But if you think, wow, those, those tears represent... It's not such an important question, but in the context it's important because then... Think of, think of an ocean full of tears. How much sadness is required for a notion? Well, how much sadness is required for a small pond? It's already quite impressive, but imagine an ocean of tears. How much sadness? And that's how much, that's less than, that still doesn't even approach the amount of sadness that we've gone through, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. Which isn't 
supposed to be depressing. It's in fact supposed to be liberating and make you realize, what are we doing? You know, is it really going to help me to keep doing this? Is this really the way to approach life, crying about, well, or not just crying about, but putting myself in a situation where I'm going to cry about, where, where I'm liable to tears. The Buddha said basically this, he said, you've cried so much, lifetime after lifetime. Over this woman you've cried every lifetime. And then he says, only, only foolish people. And it's, it's okay because we're 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 all foolish people. That's how, we're, how we start in life. It's okay to. It's not. This isn't meant to be criti critical. It's, or it's critical, but it's not something we should take personally. Not something he should take personally. He said, "Don't be a fool." Basically, ma sochi, don't cry. Bala jnanam. Sangsidanatanamitam. What does that mean? A sea of grief, right? Bala Janana. Anyway, this is the this sea of grief, this ocean of grief is the realm of fools. And then he taught this verse. So it's a famous verse, I think, well, I mean, it's one that I know quite well. Um, it's quite powerful, the imagery of the royal chariot. This is how we see the world. This is the epitome of, of intoxication, of, of uh, investment, excitement. We get so invested in things. When we're born, we begin to make sense of the world, and then we're presented with all these bright and colorful and uh, wonderful sensations, and we quickly learn pleasure and pain, and are encouraged and and latch on to the concept of clinging, the concept of of, of chasing after, of seeking out what will make you happy. And so as we grow up, it's our toys. And remember a child, a kid, when you get your first toy and then your next toy and then when you hear that Santa Claus gives you toys and then you send away a letter to... S and this whole Santa Claus thing, again coming back to it, it's all rubbish. It's the wrong way of going about things. It's nice that we want to give things to our loved ones, we want to share with them, but really we should be much more concerned about helping each other and giving each other what we need than, than giving each other what we want or encouraging, especially in children, encouraging the desire for uh, possessions. It's funny, you know, I mean, Christmas isn't so anyway, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but it's only a, a, a Christian concept, I think. So you go to other, like you go to Thailand, for example, and well, they talk about Christmas, but they don't celebrate it. Not well, they've started to a little bit, but not in the same way. And growing up Jewish, it was, you know, maybe you got some money for Hanukkah, if, just because all the Christian kids were getting it as well, getting gifts, but. Anyway, we, we, the point and the, why this is inter interesting is because uh, this cultivation and this encouragement of, of excitement over possession, over belongings, over the world, wanting this, wanting that, it starts with toys, games, and then we hit puberty and then it becomes... Uh, Roma, sexuality, you know, objects of sexuality, the human body becomes a, a huge attraction. And that's where we find Abhaya. He fell into this, <coughs> this realm of intense attraction that is, must be so ingrained in us. You know, think about 
how many times you've had sexual intercourse, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. How, how refined our sense of appreciation of sexual pleasure or, or sexual stimulation or physical, yeah, sexual stimulation, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, that we just jump right into it as soon as the body's ready. <laughs> it's like we're just waiting for puberty and then puberty comes, okay, I remember this. It's like uh, it's like you you, plant, you watered a you, you planted a plant and now it's grown fruit and now you can eat the fruit because we just jump right into it and immediately forming romances and falling in love and 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 being taught that this is life this is the world we teach each other we teach our children society. Our society is composed of this. I mean, society survives. Our culture, our religion, our nationality depends upon it. If people stopped having romance and sexual intercourse, you know, it it it, uh, it helps us grow and populate and and become more powerful. You know, they talk about having sons. Uh, have, well, having children, but it's always generally been sons because physical strength, I guess, was a thing. And so sons were generally more physically strong, whatever. And um, so it becomes a, a narrative that we teach ourselves. Yes, fall in love and get married and all these customs we have like marriage and so on. So, and we, so we become caught up in so many ways. The romance, in, as with this story, is the biggest one, and becoming so attracted to uh, to worldly pleasures that there's so many. Some people become attached to their car, and then you have this beautiful new car, and then it gets in an accident. We get attached to our children. How strong is the attachment of parents to their children? And then when your child, when your child uh, changes, uh, simply changes, not even gets sick or dies. Of course, that happens as well. But simply changes. How angry we, how hard it is for us to deal with when our children uh, are no longer. Uh, no longer look up to us or respect us or if they become wicked and bad people and so on. How, much, how hurtful it is, how hurtful it can be when our children are reckless, when our children hurt themselves, when our children refuse to follow the path we set out for them, how angry we become. You could talk for days about the ways we get caught up in the world. We get caught up in, this, in these narratives and these stories and and often just caught up in the shininess of it all, right? How beautiful it all is. So in this case, it may very, very well have been the case that this, you have to ask Abaya, did he really know this woman? It's interesting, we never hear the story of the dancing girl. What was she like? We don't hear even about anything about her personality, just that she, what, what is she? She was a woman who danced. That's what was important about her. That's all we hear. And so it's quite likely that that's all he knew. He didn't know her personality or her likes or dislikes. He was just caught up and he was in love with her body, most likely, and, and her skill. In you know, the, the way of dancing to tempt the eye and to be suggestive, to, to tempt the mind. There are ways that, of dancing that are seductive, we would call, right? So he was seduced quite ably by this woman. And so this is what this verse is about. So the basic lesson is talking about, I think it's important to talk about how we get caught up, how we fall into the world. We see Dante, which I think means fall, right? Sink down get sunk in the world, mired in it, oh, so caught up 
We, we get spun around and then we get old and wonder how we got here in the first place. But by then it's time to, to die and then we do it all over again. And the second part of the lesson is what's I think equally important, especially for us as meditators, is that the wise don't have any connection with the world. And that's a simple statement. You can take it in a conventional sense to just be a support of the Buddhist, Buddhist philosophy, not to cling. But I think there's an important, it's important to, to stress exactly how, I mean, this takes special importance in Buddhism, which places such a high uh, em emphasis on wisdom. And the point is that no, it's not that because you agree with the Buddha that it makes you wise. The point is that people that clinging to things is not just because um, you've decided to make that your life and and or you've decided that that's your path. It's that you don't understand it. We cling to things because we don't understand them. It's not that you haven't studied Buddhism or you have to learn that the Buddha said it's wrong. But a desire for a thing is based on a lack of understanding of that thing. Proper understanding, objective understanding, not Buddhist understanding. And so this is one way of, of describing the very core of, of Buddhist mental development. It's not to take on beliefs or views that it's wrong to cling. It's about studying, objectively studying the things that you cling to, studying your clinging, studying your desire for things, and coming to the logical conclusion, which happens to be that they're not worth clinging to, that there's nothing in the world worth clinging to. Now, it's not something intellectual or something you have to spend time debating with yourself or analyzing rationally. It's something that you see quite clearly through the practice. Watching yourself engage in desire, watching yourself acquire the things you desire, observing mindfully the process of clinging shows you without any doubt that it's not worth it. It's not worth clinging to. This is what is meant by the wise have no connection. It's not belief, it's not conviction, it's not effort. It's not about pushing yourself so hard that you break free. It's not about breaking your habits. It's about studying your habits, analyzing them. Or analyzing them by means uh, methodically observing them again and again. If you're, if you're uh, intent enough upon that sort of practice, you'll see for yourself the nature of reality. You, you'll become free from suffering. You know, the idea is that it's not the world that's causing us suffering. It's not the loss of a loved one that causes us suffering. It's our, our reaction to our experiences. It's our investment in them. It's not, even, it's not even just our reaction, it's our setting ourselves up to react. Because th that's the thing, when sadness comes, you can't say, okay, I know this is going to be a bad thing, so I'm just not going to react this time. You can't do that. You can't say, no, no, this thing I loved, yes, reacting to its loss would be bad, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't even work that way. You become overwhelmed by it, and that's the nature of clinging. And so the learning process is learning this truth, that clinging is not to your benefit. It doesn't lead to greater good. It leads only to stress and suffering. And so that's... Uh, That's the benefit of, of wisdom. A wise person doesn't suffer, quite simply. 
they free themselves, no more tears. Free themselves from suffering. So that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for listening.